one of the things I love doing is like being a pioneer of your own journey for people to watch yeah. and maybe experience that for themselves. Your own vulnerability and talking about your own insecurities and your own joys and pains allows someone to to come along that journey and maybe experience it in a way that they're not they can't articulate or you know they're not gifted to write a song and hit a chord that makes them feel that but they get to kind of come along your journey and that's yeah. that, that's that gets me up in the morning honestly hey what's up y'all welcome to this week's episode of the stay human podcast as always presented by the great gibson guitars and epiphone and man all the amazing stuff that they have there if you're ever in nashville go to the gibson garage it is an incredible journey to just see what they put together there it's like a i wouldn't say a museum because you can pick everything up and actually play it unlike a museum um i got really busted at the louvre when i tried to you know sort of handle the uh, the mona lisa one year they they, they bounced me out of there pretty quick uh, <laughs> but um the gibson garage is awesome in nashville check it out so i'm super excited because i've got somebody on the show who i've known for a very long time over the span of his career this multi-platinum singer songwriter and producer has released five studio lps he's claimed the number one spot on itunes and his top multiple billboard charts with over 1.6 million albums sold and over two and a half billion streams worldwide god that's such a freaky number to even think of <laughs> he shared the road with everyone from john mayer to need to breathe as well as headlining countless tours on his own please welcome to the stay human podcast the great matt carney how you doing matt hey man good to see you man it's great and to hear your voice you. i love it and be seen man um where are you right now i'm in nashville i'm in my studio in nashville tennessee um it's nice. cold it's currently cold uh uh but yeah man here in nashville i i'm in um bali and it's currently about 85 degrees <laughs> Dude, it's, don't uh, rub it's it in. 10 in the morning here and uh <laughs> I just finished a crazy workout i'm dripping in sweat and i'm um, drinking a dragon fruit smoothie <laughs> wait it's 10 it's, in the morning it's 10 in the morning here where is it where you, is nashville it, it's eight eight PM. eight o'clock at night yeah 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 so i'm in the future and i can tell you the future is <laughs> is great man it's awesome hey um I, how many years have we known each other now it's been since 2007 eight nine yeah nine, it's I probably i feel like yeah it, was it like a radio show or something yeah. Yeah. I mean, I remember opening for you at the Ryman. Is I think it was yeah. the first time I ever played at the Ryman, which was like yeah. really, really special for me. Uh, yeah. We did an acoustic set. So, and that probably, I bet that was 2009, but we had known each yeah. other before that. So yeah, somewhere around then, yeah. right when I was starting out, honestly, that was like yeah. the very beginning of my journey was back Well, then. I remember when they told me that you were going to be the support act at the Ryman. And I was like, God, I know that name. And they, can you send me the music? And they sent me the music. I was like, Oh man, I love this dude. <laughs> and, uh, I remember us having met at that time. And so, um, man, it's that's been, a, a, that, that's a special place in Nashville. That was a big night for me. Cause I, I worked at the, about that. I worked at the Starbucks next door. That was my job before music was I was a barista at Starbucks a small stint as a banquet server at the Opryland hotel, but that, yeah. those are my last two jobs. So yeah, we would go to work every day and the Ryman was right there. It's, you know, it's this huge yeah. people I've been there. It's like this beautiful church looking structure oh, in Nashville, incredible. just downtown it's Nashville, a, sh a shrine to, to music. And yeah, it's, it's just like an incredible place. The home of country music, you know, all these heroes, Johnny Cash. Anyway. So that was the first time I had gotten to, go on stage yeah. and play it. So it was a big night for me just because being the kid that had been a barista next door, looking at it, it's, to finally it's, such, on the stage. it's, it's so you too. Cause it's the, you know, the typical lineage is I was driving a truck <laughs> on a cow farm and yeah. here I am at the rhyme <laughs> and yeah, you're right. like, yeah, I was working at Starbucks next door. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was making cat faces in your coffee yeah. and here I am, you know? Um, so, I want to do a deep dive on who you are and where you come from. You know, where were you before you landed at that Starbucks? And you know, go go all the way back to where where were you raised? What was your family like? Yeah, I'm I am a sixth generation Oregonian on my mother's wow. side. So, so I was, I'm born in Eugene, Oregon. Uh, wow. Go Ducks. So yeah. my, my family was like, Stevens too. Yeah. Right. Totally. My, my mom's side, they were like literally covered wagon, you know, like the game Oregon trail. Did wow. you play that as a kid yeah. Sure, on, yeah. in keyboard yeah. class? That yeah. was like my family. So they settled out West. 
uh, my dad's from Rochester, but I grew up in Eugene, Oregon, small kind of cool hippie college town. I had a lot of artists in my family, no music, none of that. I was kind of a, I was actually a soccer player more than anything growing up. Wow. What did your and, parents do? Uh, my dad was a business lawyer. And after they had followed Pink Floyd through Europe for a while and uh, met in Hawaii, they settled in Eugene. And my dad, he said, I, he went straight and became a lawyer. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but he was like, a you know, just small town, like help people set up wills and help businesses yeah. write contracts. Just, you know, kind of like yeah. uh, ran a pra- his own practice there. And my my mom was a uh, marriage and family therapist. So um, counselor and worked at a church for a while. So she was really like the spiritual kind of taught me like the songs could go deep and like was always like, how are you feeling? What are you feeling? How do you feel about that? How does that make you feel? You know, what are you really scared of? What, you know, so like, which is shows up in my music, you know, half the time, that's what I feel like I'm doing is trying to touch on my own journey inside my own heart for other people, you know, like if I can do it, then I'm walking someone else through there. So, yeah. So that, yeah, we, yeah, that was just grew up in Eugene, Oregon little town to seem like a big town. And sisters. Yeah. Middle of three boys. So, okay. Oh, wow. I was the one that caused all the trouble. Uh, I think I was the only one that got arrested, you know, three or four times to get arrested uh, for, you know, I don't know. Uh, graffiti. <laughs> I was like the punk graffiti kid. We, I, we hung out downtown and Eugene had this legal like graffiti wall that was actually really, yeah. it's actually how I got into music. Mm. Um, and so you, we'd skip school and go down and one of my friends was a big artist. So we'd paint all these murals. And then sometimes at night we'd go to the train yards and paint trains. That's, uh, you know, very disappointing to hear, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I was there with you in, in spirit because my very first show outside of San Francisco was then I had this punk rock band called the beat nigs and we were alternative tentacles records the dead kennedy's record label yep. and our very first show outside of san francisco was in eugene and it was in this punk rock i wouldn't even call it a club because it was actually like a storage space it was in this like storage space unit um and they, no had, way. they had they had just opened up like two storage spaces and they had a you know garage <laughs> metal door and you'd load in and they'd shut the door no and they turn up the music really loud and 50 kids would slam dance in there. Was it like a real mm-hmm. venue or? It was a real venue. Like, like they allowed shows there and, and, I wonder uh, what, you know, what year would this have been? 1988, 1988. Yeah. Wow. I would love to know where that was. There's still a storage unit there. There Probably. was a band there called the radiators, I think. And that was their, their spot. Yeah. I, I was like um, Cherry, Cherry Pop and Daddy's era, if you remember them. They were Eugene Band. Sure. Oh, yeah. Which, I remember which them. That, they were like actually more punk rock when they started. They got more mm-hmm. big band swing. But like when, if mm-hmm. you go to their shows early on, it was like he had like no shirt on and like tight black pants and like it was like a punk show, like like a yeah. no doubt show. Everyone was like, you know, like crowd surfing and yeah. Mosh pits I used to see them at um, the Kennel Club in San Francisco when I was the doorman there. I love and, it. Uh, they did a lot of great shows. Um, so when you were a kid growing up, greatest challenges for you, you know, like you're talking about your mom saying, you know, what's, what's going on with you and, and asking you about your, your feelings. What was it like when you're like, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13, just that kind of coming of age period for you? What were the, the biggest (laughs) challenges for you? Let's go deep coming. I mean, I feel like, I don't know about you, but. I mean, through therapy, my own journey as a human, as an Mm -hmm. artist, I feel Mm -hmm. like I am like third grade. And I've, I've actually studied this a little bit are maybe some of the most formative years of your life. Like you're, you're kind of, and I'm I'm realizing now I was dyslexic actually at the time. Mm -hmm. I'm still, still am. (laughs) Me (laughs) too. Yeah. yeah, Awesome. Yeah. I didn't know that. I mean, and and I, I thought, you know, they always tell you if you're dyslexic, it means there was like the after school special and it's like the one dude who can't read and he's like yeah. hiding in the back of the class. And that's yeah. what dyslexia was. But um, the more research I've done, it's kind of a spectrum and mm-hmm. it can be, you don't necessarily process uh, the systems as you're supposed to, or some, I have a, like a pretty weird visual memory. I'm almost like mm-hmm. photographic, almost like I can kind of remember images from every show, like mm-hmm. 
it's weird. And, the, and I was talking to a specialist and they're saying sometimes when kids had like a strength in one area, it means they leaned on that, like maybe you have a visual memory and yeah. you don't, you don't learn the actual system of like spelling and reading the way that you're supposed to. And then once mm-hmm. you get out of those like third, fourth grade years of your life, kind of like a foreign language, you, you don't ever learn it as well as you would have later in your life because you've developed this okay. other system that doesn't really. So it cannot always be a bad thing anyway. So, you know, in that season of my life, I was always getting in trouble. I was acting out. Mm-hmm. But a lot of it was just because I didn't really know how to function in like a normal sitting mm-hmm. in a desk, staring at a teacher, you know, kind of a strict school. Just I just didn't function well and in in many ways formed a lot of personal traits that I love and also my wife said wouldn't love you know just (laughs) that season (laughs) yeah your your sense of injustice like if someone accuses you of something you know like if you're a third grader and you're treated as if you're doing something maliciously when you're not you're just distracted you know that sticks with you and so I think in in a lot of ways a lot of those forces of that era of my life in Eugene, Oregon are some of the things I still write about. And Mm -hmm. I I don't know, I still, I don't know if there's a part of me that maybe will always be a third grade kid. Yeah. You know, I feel that same way. Like I, I enjoy drawing every now and then. And when I mean every now and then, I mean like twice a year, I'll sit down and draw a picture and, but I do really enjoy it. And, and I'll look at back at the photo and I'll go, it's exactly the same <laughs> style and face. And the, I do yeah. the eyes exactly the same way as when I was in sixth grade. Cause yeah. that's like when I stopped drawing, you know, yeah. and you know, as an adult, then like you mentioned, we have this opportunity to like, you know, you didn't learn to, you, you ate with your fingers as a kid. And then you decided at some point, like I'm going to eat with a knife and fork and I'm going to actually learn how to do these things that help me like what you describe in your relationship with your wife. Like, um, at what point did you, that start to become like awareness for you that, that was it later, like when you were out of high school or at what point did you start to go, Hmm, I need to start like diving into some of this stuff. Yeah. It's probably in the last, yeah, I would say mar- marriage is a big one. Last couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Like it was last Monday. Um, no, I mean, yeah. When you have another human that's like right there, like a mirror, yeah. And like, why yeah. are you doing that? Like, you yeah. know, like that's you're rude right now. Or it's like uh, we were brought together to push each other's buttons oh, so we could figure shit out. You know, totally. I like. Yeah. Yes, I. I you're a hundred percent drawn to your yin and yang. Like I think in relationships, you are drawn to that person. You know, me, me and my wife will go see, you know, therapists or people just to touch in every once in a while. Just, it just is yeah. a healthy thing and. Mm-hmm. Well, we saw this one lady and she would always say like, you know, some people say like, you know, if they get in the relationship, like, I don't want to, I'm just going to find someone else. Like the funny part is they're usually drawn to someone similar to the person that didn't, you know, they were just with, cause like you're generally, you are made up to be drawn to a specific kind of person that like is your opposite. And all the things yeah. that are drawing you to them are also the part that annoy you and like challenge. And I think it's like intended that way. You know, it's like, yeah. there's growth in that. So yeah, a lot of my journey in some of the personal stuff was, you know, the last maybe eight years, me and my wife have really been, well, we've been together 10 years now. So, uh, but you know, you go through the honeymoon phase and then you kind of hit some things and she's like, wow, you really like, I she, she comments sometimes about when I would read, she's like, interesting. Cause I was an English major. I'm, (laughs) I'm known as like a, a, a literary guy. Like I read and yeah. And, and she's noticing how the speed with which I read and sometimes the way I spell and like, she's like, interesting. And she one day pulled up this sheet of like, if you're dyslexic, maybe you would have some of these traits. And it was like a list Mm. of 50. And it was literally like every single one I was reading. And I started, I was laughing as I'm reading this list, you know, and I'm getting to the end and I'm starting to get like emotional and I'm getting at the yeah. bottom, of the, like it started as a laugh and then I'm like tearing up. I'm like, I, this <laughs> is me. Like I'm known, you know, and, and which started a journey of me kind of discovering it and, 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 uh, exploring what that meant for me. But some of that, like a enlarged sense of justice or some of yeah. that, that like you're driven. That was an interesting one that I, you know, it was just mm-hmm. one of the lists that I was like, that's totally me. And if, if you're a kid who's misunderstood, you know, or misrepresented and treated as if you're being malicious, like, oh, you're just being yeah. a punk and you're not, yeah. you're just, tr- you're just trying to like 
just be you. you yeah, just you're just up. you're yeah. literally trying to hang in there. You know, yeah, like that aggravates you. You're like, this sucks. Like, I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm like trying to help this kid, or I I was trying to talk to him, this kid because he needed help, or you know, and your teacher standing up and put, you know, that really puts a yeah. sense of you. And but that's not always good, you know. If you're in if you're yeah. in a parking lot and some guy takes your parking space and you're out of your car like freaking out at him then your wife's mm-hmm. like hey babe like i don't know if this is yeah if i need yeah. to work on this part right here like yeah. <laughs> i know he stole he, your spot but <laughs> i feel you I, and I, I grew up the same way and i grew up you know as somebody as a kid who was picked on a lot and i also feel that same thing that like enlarged sense of of justice and injustice that i that has followed me in my career and in my music and in everything i do and I feel like, uh, you know, as I've grown, that that value isn't so much. I, I, I literally used to say that my mission in life was to be the best musical communicator of social justice that I could be. Not the best in the world, but the best that I could be, you know. Yeah. And But now I think of it more as not just social justice, but the values of how people are able to be their authentic self like how is it that people can be who they are and still be accepted and embraced by other people's uh, and celebrated by other people for being their unique self and that's what's exciting to me about what you do matt and like what you were describing earlier about how you just tell your soul and tell your story of what's going on inside you and you know i hear that little bits of it that are part of me or that I get, you know, or like, like this morning I was just listening to wanted man right before he came out. And I was like, you know, it's, it's a, it's a clever (laughs) metaphor of, you know, I want to be a Bonnie and Clyde, like wanted kind of, but it's like, I want to be wanted. I want to be, feel like I matter to somebody that I, that I'm significant in the world and especially to the person that I love. And, and then there's days in my relationship where I don't, I don't feel yeah. wanted or I don't feel desired or I don't feel appreciated or I don't feel liked or I don't feel like I'm like I'm showing up and meeting my partner's needs, you know? Yeah. And so like when I hear your voice in your music, it's, 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 it's inspiring to hear you bearing it out like that. And how does that come back to you? Like when you write a song like that, you go and you perform it or you meet somebody on the yeah. street who says, Hey, I dig your music. I like this song. It touched me in some way. You know, it's like, um, thank you for saying that. Yeah. Like I really, I feel like that is my, my superpower I've learned, you know, it takes a while. I just, I just knew when I first started music, it was like, what's something like super vulnerable. I can just say, because I, I don't know what else to do, but I just yeah. accept to be super real and like that seems to carry weight. And I, that's all I just knew what to do was like find something that was like part of it was how I pro- was processing life. So if something was difficult or really hard or really emotional or I didn't understand it or I was confused by it and it was like traumatic in my life, I was like, OK, I have to write a song about it. Mm. And, and that was just kind of how I did life was I would find these things. And if something crazy happened, I'd go in off the corner. I just I'd write a song about it. And you know, in the process of that, as you're writing it, you're like, you're starting with this problem. And then I would really try to find not on purpose, but I would naturally kind of find this redemptiveness about whatever this Mm -hmm. was, or like the God part of it that felt like even in this, like there'd be some healing for you. Like, yeah, totally. Or like you're, and you're finding, like you're seeing the bigger picture. Like you're not Mm -hmm. just, you know, and I've never been someone who can just write like just a sad song. You generally, there's some kind of redemptive something that happens in it because I, it's me processing my own stuff. And, and I think the more I did that and I put songs out in the world, people really responded to it. I, it's taken me a few years to realize like, that's kind of one of the things I love doing is like being a pioneer of your own journey for people to kind of watch and maybe experience that for themselves, your own vulnerability and talking about your own insecurities and your own joys and pains allows someone to to come along that journey and maybe experience it in a way that they're not, they can't articulate or, you know, they're not gifted to write a song and hit a chord that makes them feel that, but they get to kind of come along your journey. And that's, that, that's, that gets me up in the morning, honestly. I love that too. And I'm I'm very similar to you in that I, I, I don't like to write songs that end just, 
me saying some dark shit and then yeah, I don't yeah. fix it. You know what I mean? And it's I like, know I just never did that I, either. I write that I am the same way in that I write from my greatest emotions, my peak emotions. It could be the peak of my sadness or my anger or my frustration, or it could be the peak of my joy and elation. But what I always try to do is tell the story of how I got there, you know? And so there's always like this dark side, you know, like, yeah um to to getting to to where i'm going and actually because people say to me all the time they're like you're always happy it seems like you're always happy and i'm like well you, you listen to my records you're hearing like this joyful music and yeah but if you go and do a deep dive on it it's me processing my shit to get to that happy place yeah but i really love melancholy music and i'm i was wondering that was one of the things <laughs> i was going to ask you is do yeah. you like do you like oh, yeah. melancholy music because yeah. i think of like you know, I, I grew up, you know, in the Northern California, just, you know, a couple hundred miles south of you. Uh, and in San Francisco, it's cold all the time. It's chilly. It's sweater weather almost, you know, nine yeah, months, yeah. 12, 10, 11 months of the year. And there's, but there's something that I remember as a kid, you know, going to see concerts in San Francisco. And I would, I would, something felt good about listening to melancholy music yeah. and i would listen to like the cure or i would listen to you know depeche mode or i would listen to yeah other bands that that were like tears for fears that had like this melancholy and not not just not sadness i feel like melancholy is like a different feeling than yeah. like just being sad or something yeah but i've always wondered that about you do you <laughs> is that part of your you know musical lineage of just that yeah. Melancholy bomb. I think, I mean, I, I would, yeah, I guess so. Like, I think that, uh, yeah, Eugene, Oregon, something about like the cliche is like the rainy day and you're like with your journal and you're sitting in the coffee shop and just like having this moment that's like not just sunny and joyful. I totally like that is a huge part of what formed me and the music I love, you know, Sufjan Stevens to, you know, not, it's not necessarily sad, but like, or even in like, um, John Prine or some of these, like yeah. you put them on and like Tom Waits, William put, Fitzsimmons, Tom yeah, Waits, yeah. you put it on and you're just like, it's like, there's a like slay you kind of mm -hmm. just like heaviness to it. That's not, it's not, yeah, it's not just sad. It's not like I'm gonna jump it off a bridge. This is the worst, you know, but it's like this, the weight of the world in a yeah. beautiful way that's real. And it like touches mm -hmm. on the human experience, you know, I've always, all the movies I've loved have always been that way where it's just like, you don't, you're the weight of all the reality of the world is a part of it. Cause that is where the real beautiful stuff comes from. It's like, yeah. when it's like heavy, you can also have the reality. If it's just, you know, fake and surfacey, we're not ever, it, it can't be that happy. You know, like it's like, I'll, yeah. I'll never forget. I was at a um, uh, goodwill hunting, right. That movie, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, yeah, whatever. Love it. Yeah. And, and it's kind of heavy and you're like trying to figure it out. And there's the line where he like, he goes, Hey, did you, do you like apples? You know, you like apples. And that guy's like, what? He's like the punk guy. And he's like, do you like apples? And he goes, well, I got her number. You like the, you know, he slaps the number on the, how about them apples yeah. and like throws it. And I've never heard an audience laugh harder in a movie ever. Like just yeah. died laughing. Like, cause it caught him so off guard and it was like in this dramatic scene and no one saw it coming. And it was like the fun. And I took, I was like, man, that is, harder than anyone laughs in Ace yeah. Ventura or like some comedy or any slapstick thing. Yeah. Yes. It was just yeah. like pure people belly laughing, like crying a, out of relief out of like, it's like letting go. You yes. Know? And, and, and that's like real life. Yeah. I think something yeah. like that is like what I love in music is this like kind of holding both pillars. Cause you can, you, you have a lot of weight both ways. And, but don't yeah. get me wrong. I love just feel good. Just happy stuff. music. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, too. I mean, Bob Marley's probably my favorite artist of all time. Like, uh, which I think which, Bob did both. You know, Bob was oh, totally. you know, like, if you hear like "Sun Is Shining," it's got yeah. especially like the original like Lee Scratch Perry uh, production yeah. of "Sun Is Shining," where it's just got that melodic on it, and it's just so melancholy. But it's a song about being out in the sunshine. You know, the yeah. song "Sun Is Shining," the weather is sweet, but it, the music couldn't be any more dark or mysterious, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and that's where like that spirituality hits. And, and it's something that I've been like uh, discussing with, with friends a lot lately is, is what is joy, you know, like, and the, 
if I heard a, a preacher in San Francisco describe it one time, he said, joy is the intersection between the human and the divine. And that's why sometimes when you feel joy, you cry. And yeah. sometimes when you feel joy, you laugh, yeah. you know, it's just those moments when you feel like that human and the divine coming together. And, and that's what I love about like what you describe when you feel like a great film that has that weight and it brings you to tears and then it brings you to laughter right yeah. after that. You know, it's like those moments when you're just feeling that sense of soul, that sense of like letting go, that yeah, sense man. of ease of heart. And, and I feel like that's like what you, like with Bob Marley, I feel like that's the power. It's like oh, yeah. this combination of the, the music and the movement, the bass, like the dynamic energy of the bass that yeah. flows through your body. And then those powerful soul searching lyrics that are, about optimism and about yeah. joy and about finding light even in the darkest times how did that come to you like what, do you remember the first time you heard a marley record like what what age were you well in in eugene oregon so like you know eugene oregon's like wasn't bob marley the mayor of eugene oh dude like he was like yeah, yeah he was like i mean in my high school we had a, a mural of the uprising cover that some student had painted mm -hmm. so i just thought everyone there was a whole like Bob Marley cult, basically. There was like the dudes that had the dreadlocks and they were like basically lived off the grid, you know, like my homie Serge and Michael, they were like really good basketball players. Actually, this is like super hardcore Bob Marley, like just, they were like deadheads for Marley. They had every live yeah. recording and uh, I was buddy, I'd go hang out with them and, you know, they were like Eugene hip, they're like, just like, parents yeah. are like, maybe they don't have electricity. Maybe they don't, you know, like they have to go to school because the government tells them to, but like probably wouldn't be there if, if they didn't have to, you know, if, yeah. if, they, if their parents wouldn't get in trouble. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, that group just really like initially got me into it and it was just around, it was just such a part of the culture in Eugene. Every kid had Bob Marley records. Like I remember when I moved to Nashville and you know, the whole pop thing, I thought people had like in-sync records and like mm -hmm. boy band records in their seat back in the case logic. And I was like, why do, why do you have this? They're like, everyone has yeah. this. I'm like, no, yeah. they don't. No one listens to this music. I thought this is just corny stuff on TV. And they're like, yeah. no man, this is so like diamond records. I was like, nobody at my high school had, what are you talking about? <laughs> like everybody, Bob Marley's the biggest artist in the world. Right. And they're like, no, I don't have his records. I'm like, Oh, yeah. okay. So yeah, just growing up in Eugene, Oregon, it was X, hippie world so it was like dylan yeah. and marley and and james taylor and a lot of yeah. beatles and a lot of dead yeah the dead were big there was a whole crew of that that was just all about the dead and i didn't really i missed all that i was actually i my my way to rebel was like fully east coast hip-hop music so in eugene mm. there was like a small group of people that listened to hip-hop music just because i don't know we were it was it was like that mob deep era and mm -hmm. and Trap Called Quest and yeah. De, La, De La Soul. And I mean, I'm sure you've brushed shoulders. With I was out on tour with all of them. We were yeah. on the same label with Mob Deep at Fourth and Broadway and in and, and the early 90s. Dude, and, yeah, I mean, I had tour, your record. So, De La, Tour with all the Tribe, all those. Yeah. Dude, I mean, that's cool. I, I saw Tribe at um, University of Oregon when I was in, I think it was in the ninth grade. But um, mm -hmm. yes, because I had one of, so I was trying to remember this. Hole in the Bucket, right? Hole in the Bucket. That was the very first Spearhead album, Home. Yeah. Which I had the single, the tapes, the single of... The cassette whole, single. Well, I'm, assume, I'm assuming yeah. I did, but... Yeah, yeah, that, for that sure. Was, was that the first or second single off that record? That was the first single, but there was like a... Uh, you know, there back was a, then you used to put out these little EPK kind of things. It would be like a cassette with four songs on it, and it would be sort of a white label, no cover on it. Yeah. So, but that was because, because I remember the music video. Whole, yeah. Like on the bucket. Yeah. Was that, did that, I, I don't know why I have such vivid memories of that video. Like it was on MTV all the time. That song was like, it never really got played on the radio, but we made a really powerful video for it. And the video just got played all the time. And, and uh, yeah, that was, that was a, it was it was kind of like a light switch moment in my career you know just like the power of television how suddenly like people would recognize me walking down the street you know and because this is probably you know, 92 94. 93 yeah 94 yeah so I, I was wondering this because that song 
I, I was trying to look it up and I was like, to me, it like, I remember that same thing. Like it arrested me. I don't know if I was watching the MTV. I was like, what is this? Yeah. And I remember the story. I was like this whole story thing, you know, like, yeah. You don't know why you have the hole in your pocket. You're like, or, or yeah. the, you don't know why you have the thread, which finds out it's the hole in your pocket, right? The whole thing. Yeah. And I just was like, this is the coolest song. What is this? What's the story? So I was looking it up actually before this. I was, and I was trying to see, it must have been a hit on the radio or something. And I couldn't find anything. So it was mostly yeah. lived in the MTV on world. On MTV. Yeah. Just was it on like, MTV. Like, I don't even know if it ever really got played on the radio. Because uh, at that time, that's right when like gangster rap was coming in. And, and so that song was getting played all the time on on TV, but but the radio had moved to other, you know, just all, you know, 24 hours of the chronic, you know, and other records like that. Oh, yeah, because that um, would have just been happening. Yeah. Was like yeah. Diggable Planets, like diggable that kind of that era. Yeah. yeah, we were we were out on tour with Diggable Planets. Arrested Development was was blowing up at that same time you know i love yeah. that yeah tenant that was my jam yeah i had that i had those records well because the bay area had a moment that that was the only thing we caught so so in eugene oregon you couldn't you didn't listen to it wasn't really cool to be into like la rap like no one really yeah. liked like that thing like yeah maybe like you know some people were in, like dre and snoop sure you could listen to that yeah. but like none of the whatever mg ball like none of that we were yeah. it was all either east coast or bay area you like far side was yeah. huge yeah, the far side yeah del the it, funky homo sapien yes um like uh, hieroglyphics was, yeah. oh yes like in a uh, hieroglyphics was in a band called latirix i don't know if you ever yeah latirix sure yeah with like yeah. uh dj shadow and that whole thing that yeah, was like DJ shadow yeah the biggest thing in my yeah. High school. We had this like we were their cult following in in Eugene. Like Latirix, mm. we had every vinyl. Thought oh, they were yeah. the coolest thing. Which they never really hit big, but I remember they came up for a show at Wow Hall in Eugene, Oregon. And I think I was probably a sophomore in high school. Or no, actually I I must have been later because I was in college. So this would have been my freshman year of college. And I was going to school in Chico, California, your stomping grounds. Yeah. And Latirix played a show in, at Wow Hall in Eugene when I was home for break. And we just said every word. And I was like, and, the, you know, there was like maybe thinking back now, now that I like am an artist and tour, I, I would pay attention to crowd sizes now. And I, you know, how many people are there? Like, you just get good at knowing that number. Yeah. There's probably 50 people there at tops. Yeah. You know, yeah. like not a big show. Like, yeah, they were probably playing there. You know, the room was probably a quarter of the way full. They were probably discouraged knowing if I was them, came all the way up to Eugene. There's like 20 kids singing their song, you know. We were so into it. And they hung out afterwards and they like, I bought a vinyl and had them sign it. I'm like, oh, I go to school in Chico. He's like, oh, we need to play down there. And I was like, oh, you're way bigger here than in Chico, man. This is like, you know, we have, you know. And I just remember seeing his face kind of deflate. <laughs> <laughs> and now I, it took me 20 years to realize like what I had told him, like, no, this is as good. Like, you're bigger here than this in This is as good as it gets. <laughs> yeah, 20, 20, 20 people in Eugene is bigger than the 15 you'll get in Chico. Uh, but yeah, that was my whole world. So like, it's it's funny we became friends after all that because that yeah. i had such a vivid memory of that video and this like kind of storytelling yeah. spoken word thing which weird the acoustic was, guitar riff in it too yeah, yeah i mean that was kind of part of my i came from that school of like that was part of what people thought was so weird was i had an acoustic guitar and i couldn't really sing so when mm -hmm. i was in college i would just kind of like make up stories and kind of write simple hooks and i was kind of learning it all a few chords and, you know, inspired by people like yourself and Everlast and Fuji's and Outkast and like kind of the blending of singing and like music and, and then all my full groups. flow too. Yeah. I hear that, you know, um, just the flow in your, in your lyrics, you know, I can, I can hear that you were hip hop inspired, you know, and when did it start to come together for you? Like, like, I, I'm curious about you, you mentioned that you played soccer. Did you play in college too, or was it? I did. I went, that's what ended up in Chico. I was, okay. I was supposed to play at Seattle Pacific, which is funny. It's like kind of a probably more conservative, like, but really good soccer school. And I've been kind of recruited. I was, I was pretty good in high school, but didn't get in. I had a terrible student. Cause I was, you know, I was getting arrested and, <laughs> and off. 
in my Volkswagen Squareback, like painting trains. And, um, but I was, soccer was the one thing that kind of kept me level-headed, honestly, it was yeah, a gift. Kept you in, on track because you had to get at least a, you know, 2.2 or whatever. You yeah. And, school, and, you know? and you just had to be somewhat disciplined. You had to go to, you had to show up to practice. You know, I was on a travel team. So there was like a lot of work you had to do. Yeah. And I didn't get into Seattle Pacific with my grades. So last minute, this coach from Chico had come to a, a tournament I'd played in Medford, Oregon. And he said, Hey man, if you come to Chico, I'll, you know, get like, you can get books. It wasn't a scholarship. It was like, yeah. we'll give you books or something, you know, <laughs> somehow it's got blown out of proportion. People are like, Oh, you were, you got a scholarship. I was like, no, I think they gave me one Norton anthology English book, you know? <laughs> uh, but I went to Chico and played soccer there for yeah, three years. That's when I started writing music. My roommate had a guitar, didn't really do any music, was just kind of the kid that could freeze. Actually, I was like, would, you know, we'd go paint some wall, sneak out one night. We'd all get super high and then like freestyle in my Volkswagen Squareback. And I was like really good at it. Weirdly, people would be like, dude, what is happening? And then I would start like, instead of just like talking about, you know, I'm this guy, braggadocious stuff. I would just end up like yeah. start telling stories and I would like get really weird and like emotional. And I just take, tell some crazy story and then I'd go home and I'd write them. And my friend gave me a four track tape. So I started making little tapes, just telling these weird journal entries that were like wow. not, they weren't like urban anything. It wasn't me trying to be a rapper. Mm -hmm. I would just like, but it would be this weird, unique story. So I had that just for my friends. It was just, you know, they passed it around our high school or a few people had a car and I maybe three songs, four songs. Mm -hmm. And when I went to college, my roommate, I didn't have any of that gear, you know, the little four track anymore. I had to give it back to my friend. So I just had my roommate had a, a guitar. So I started just playing a few chords and I would try to learn some, you know, Dave Matthews song and it'd be too hard. Mm -hmm. So, so I just play a few chords and then just start doing what I'd done before and make up stuff. And I, I, I just fell in love with it. Like all the English major in me, you know, I'd always been good at words. I'd been good at writing things down. It was kind of the only, the only way I got through school was writing. I, mm. you, I, I, I couldn't really hang in there and do all the homework for science and math, but I could always write a paper and I loved English. So I just started writing songs and it was this weird, like hat, just glove that fit and um, started playing them for friends. And like, these are pretty good. And I recorded a few and met this guy who was traveling to Nashville and was still just playing by myself, maybe a few coffee shops, maybe for some friends. And he said, Hey, if you help me drive across the country, we'll record more of your songs. And I, and that was my junior year of college. And I was supposed to go for a month, you know, and we moved out to Nashville. We drove this Chevy truck across the country, slept in the back of it, got to Nashville, slept in a parking lot for a while. And, uh, you know, after a month I was like, this is it. I love this. I just want to do this. All I want to do is write songs. I just was obsessed with creating music yeah. and dropped out of school and called my dad. I was like, sorry, dad, drop, I'm not coming back. And what was his response? <laughs> he was, uh, I mean, weirdly, he was, you know, weirdly he was like, I don't know. They were supportive in a weird way. I remember him being like, okay, you're on your own. Like, you know, yeah just go get a job, figure it out. If that's what you want to do. Yeah. Uh, I remember him being like, you need to go to school if you can. Cause I had one year left, you know, it was like, yeah. dude, just finish school. Did you and finish I, or you still got a year left? No, I enrolled. <laughs> yeah. I still have a year left. I still, I think I have, I enrolled it. I came to Tennessee and the only place I could get in was um, Tennessee state, which was mm -hmm. uh, HBC. It was a historic like, you know, campus, which was awesome. Mm -hmm. I went from, you know, white ass Eugene, Oregon, Chico, he's pretty, you know, it's kind of diverse, but not really to like yeah. the, all this all black university. And I'm like the only kid, white kid in all my classes. And I, I like loved that semester, but I still was like, all I did is music the whole time and basically failed out all my classes and just started doing music full time. Yeah. And so, so no, you never graduated. I have not finished. No, I'm still, <laughs> I'm still a junior. I, me too, actually. And um, I got one, I got one year to go. 
And the only thing that's keeping me from doing it is a math class. I, I have to, I have like one math requirement and I'm just like, I will never do it. I, I could yeah. and a few years ago, um, I was at my old school, University of San Francisco, and they wanted to give me like an honorary degree. And my wife just like jumped in the conversation was like, oh, hell no, because she has like a master's degree and all this stuff. They're like, you ain't getting no honorary degree from the school. <laughs> like, you know, like, Take it. I was like, come on, honey. I know. Um, Chico was uh, hit, hit me up for like a, a like donor or something, you know, what after yeah. I'm like, I didn't graduate. I was like, someone's like, we could work on an honorary degree. I was like, that would be how I would totally win. Like, yes. not only I drop out of school, dad, <laughs> I went off, became a musician and they gave me a degree anyways, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, hey, I got a couple final questions for you. The, the, the first one is what's your mission? Like if you could boil it down, like this is wow. what I want. This is what my mission is through my music. Wow. Um, I think we touched on it, but I think that kind of being a pioneer for people in my own journey, with my own vulnerability, with my own fears, with my own insecurities, um, and kind of coming back to this, you know, setting out like the Oregon Trail people and their covered wagons headed for this new land. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I do feel like that's part of my calling and, and being a, kind of steered and driven to this redemptiveness that I really comes back to just this belief that God is love and that I am trying to woo people to that idea that there's like a plan, that this is purposeful, like they're created for a reason and that this is a, a beautiful life waiting for them. I think all of those are, you know, I'm not thinking about any of those when I'm writing a song, but oftentimes I look back at songs and shows I play and, and, you know, that was the guiding light that's really pulling me along that I hopefully I'm bringing people along with me. Mm. I hear you. And then the final thing is the, the question I ask everybody on the show, what does it mean to you to, to stay human? Like, what, how do you, what does it mean to be human? First of all, how do you stay that way? How do you hold on to it? Interesting question. I like that question. I heard, I've heard you ask other people. I think, you know, for me, staying human, I think being human has something to do with humility. I think it has to do with how you define yourself. I think uh, for me, staying human, ha you know, there's so many things that want to define you. It's like you could be, oh, I'm, I, I just need this record to be known and be feel mm -hmm. like I'm, I've made it. Or, oh, man, mm -hmm. I'm a recording artist now. I'm this famous whatever. People come and there's all these like these all these things that want to tell you who you are and your identity that are just kind of surface and they fall through and if and you see people fall into them all the time and in my in seasons of my own life I buy into the hype too much or I start getting up every morning and worrying about how can I keep this going or like you know mm. how can I like this is who I am what if music's taken from me who am I I don't know who I am mm. and I th I think for me you know, that idea of that I'm much more than a musician, I'm much more than, you know, somebody people pay tickets to. I'm like the neighbor and I'm the husband to my wife. I'm the dad to my kids. I'm child of God. I'm like, you know, all these things is really who I am, you know, and, and music, I love it. It's my truest passion. It's the thing that I will do to the day I die, but it isn't, it doesn't define me. It's not, mm. it gets me up in the, it's not, uh, all that I am. And I, I think that journey's taken me years to figure out, but the, the, the more I've understood it, the happier I've been and the more I've understood myself and the more I feel human, <laughs> to be honest with you. Yeah. Right on. Matt, it's been awesome to talk with you. Love and it, bro. Hear more about your story. Cause I, you know, I didn't know all of, uh, about where you came from and, and your roots and um, we have a lot in common. And uh, for folks who are, curious or want to know more about you are you on all the social channels people can find in all those Instagram i am yes all that stuff and what do you got going on this year are you going to be able to hit the road and yes get out big, there and big tour coming up um really excited my first you know it's like i think i'm, I'm also uh freaking out because i think i remember how to play all these songs i'm like, <laughs> like I'm starting over <laughs> i'm gonna have to get a teleprompter i don't know i'm, I'm almost there uh 
but yeah, man, I, I, I've got a big tour coming. I'm really excited about, I'm really excited about my, this record, January flower that I put out. Um, and I'm just really excited to go play shows and, you know, and do it in a safe way. And I, I feel like we're, this spring is going to be a really awesome time to be back in some. It's going to be a springtime for music. That's for sure, man. I mean, I like, cannot wait. It's uh, did you tour? Have you toured at all since the pandemic? We did three. There was like that moment, um, in last August or so. Yes. I did like four yeah. shows where it's like, Oh, this feels yeah. good. We played these like a few outdoor shows, yeah. um, which were awesome. Even though I, that was, I got a breakthrough case. So <laughs> I was like, Oh no, I was, I was one of the early breakthroughs. I was like, I'm fully vaccinated. This is great. And I like, my wife's like, now don't be dumb. And of course I like kind of started to run through the crowd in one moment and then, yeah. you know, got home. I'm like, okay, definitely got sick. But, um, which I was chill, you know, being you're vaccinated, it's no big deal. But um, yeah. for me, at least it wasn't. There was just a few shows. I did a few Zoom things, but no, man, it's been. We, so you're we, itching, you're ready. You've been oh, training, I'm, you're like, yeah. I am very ready, yeah. Nice. Awesome. Well, uh, everybody get out there and see Matt. See every artist, man. This is like the year to just like say, F it. I'm going to every concert I can go to. Um, everybody's out there just bringing their A game. I mean, every artist who's who's getting ready to go on tour right now is ready to deliver um, their most magical moments to every listener out there. So, Matt, thanks for being one of those exceptional people who really believes in music uh, being a, a significant part of people's life and making it fun for people. So, go follow Matt, and thank you for being on this week's edition of the Stay Human Podcast. Thanks, bro. Thanks, bro.